Good morning. Good morning. Not as big a crowd as uh, it, at the cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> Probably heard I was going to be here. Uh, yeah, Liz is not here. You have me today. So let's we'll just start out with a few announcements. Liz will be here um, May 1st. I think we're doing communion then. Yeah. Yeah. So and then, uh, uh, you can read the rest. It's just kind of difficult, these types of uh, how she lays this out. But every month you have uh, who's doing what. So we have um, Marge on the 8th, and she's preaching in Ashburnham, and then the rest. And then we have uh, Mar uh, Marcy also, which is good. And then we're doing our pledge drive, right? And so uh, May 1st, all the letters have gone out. And so if, uh, if you're so inclined, please uh, send them in before May so we know we have an idea of how the church year will be going. And then our annual meeting on the 22nd. Then we have choir practice Sundays, every Sunday. Starting, uh, we took a break this week, but next week we'll have choir rehearsal 9 a.m. Okay. Um, Bible study, uh, Liz is uh, a little um, discouraged. She doesn't see as many people that she likes at, the, at uh, up being included at the Bible study. So if you're, if you're so inclined, please, 6.30 to 8, Wednesdays. And that's about it, community open houses. Oh yes, on May 17th, we're having a open house at Emma's. That is, uh, I think it's being organized, I'm not sure who's doing that, but um, you're invited to meet pastor in a more informal setting, obviously. And there is a May 7th walk for hunger, and Becky's not here to talk about it, so there's a, you, but you also see her um, for registration and pledges. Now, how do you, how do you get a hold of her? Through emails or? <laughs> I don't know. I'm walking. And don't forget about the brunch plan is make a blanket day, also on May 7th. Oh, upstairs. 10 to noon. And actually, it's 10 to 2. Okay, 10 to 2. Yeah, so after the walk, head over to the Linus, uh, Project Linus, yeah. And that's it. Is there any others? That's the back. If I not. am walking. Huh? I'm walking. Are you walking? So, pledgers to... Uh... Tomorrow you make the check out to either the gut lunch program or the food pantry, and I'll walk, and then I just deliver those checks directly to the gut lunch or the food pantry. If you don't want to write a check out, you can go online, just put a memo on. Oh, you put it down low, thinking I wouldn't use the stool. <laughs> That's right. I'm not the only one who uses this stool. No. With that, um, please join us in our call to worship. All right. The call to worship is based on Psalm 51. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. The Lord save us. Lord grant us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's love endures forever. Now we will join us in hymn number 238. Because he lives.
today's reading is from the book of Acts. The first one is chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God according to Luke. The next reading is from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned the lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was Le Levitt, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God according to Luke. <laughs> going old school today. This is my page turning hand. This is my iPad hand. <laughs> Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We see here in the morning gospel reading, the early church was filled with the Spirit. They just, just got back from Pentecost and they spoke in many tongues and they did many, many signs and wonders. As the scripture says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. It was in a time when their early mission of spreading the gospel where there was an overwhelming desire to give everything to the church, all that you possessed. They were all in, totally committed, and they were joyful. They sold everything they had and gave it up. That's commitment. It's a quaint notion, though, and it, it based on emotion, but it can even be intellectually thought through. If I give everything to the church, to God, because God has given everything to me, amongst them the greatest gift, salvation, then why not give everything to the church and have those assets spread among those most in need? It worked for the early church, but we later see that it had its problems with the social experiment. St. Paul, who was a committed in his Jewish faith, was not a fan of this new upstart 
religion. He persecuted the church. In fact, as he said, with great zeal. It wasn't until he was visited by Christ on the road to Damascus that he had his own epiphany. Now, after that meeting, he became committed to Christ and to the faith. But he also recognized there were some problems as the, as the, as the faith grew. He wrote many letters to the faithful trying to focus on the good news of Jesus, Jesus Christ's salvation. One letter to the Thessalonians, he chided some in their congregation for being lazy or a bunch of freeloaders. In the long history of the church, this experiment eventually went away. God gave us free will, and with that free will comes responsibilities making our own decisions. Today, even though the church does not espouse the total giving of all your assets, it does not release us from the commitment to support the church and the community. When Cindy and I were first married, I would be the one to go to Mass. When we had our children and they got older, I mentioned, gently suggested, that it would be good for the family, you know, to start, as a family, start to, te- to attend a church. Well, Cindy um, had a congregational upbringing, and she wasn't really in tune with the uh, Catholic traditions. So she put me on a mission, a church forward reconnaissance, if you will, to find a church that we both feel comfortable in. Well, in spite of my better judgment, the first church I went to was the Middletown Bible Church. Not anything against Bible churches, but when Cindy found out, she was out. Well, then I found out later to become a member of this church, you had to give up your finances, or so they see, and then they would determine what level of giving was right and just. When I found that, I was out. I wasn't willing to give, make up that much commitment. But eventually found a congregational church that we both could love. As a Catholic, there was very little commitment on my part as a young Catholic. You dressed up, you listened to the eulogy, you had your communion, you sang a few songs, you put your dollar in the basket, and then within an hour, you're home, done. The congregational way was a real eye-opener for me. There you had to get involved. You had to commit. Unlike the mysterious Catholics, you never knew what was behind the curtains. The congregationalists were an open book. They let you know your finances, where their expenses are, their income, the budget, the annual meetings, Shortages where the positions need to be filled, the deacons, the trustees, the care ministries, on and on and on. And I thought the Catholics made you feel guilty. But Cindy and I were all in. And boy, did they take advantage of that. I was invited to a trustees meeting. I didn't know what it was. And then someone mentioned somewhere, I can't remember what, it, what the particulars were, but it was, has to do with the building, and they needed someone to do something, I forgot. But they, I said, oh, I'll do it, but I don't have a key. And the next thing I know, two people were reaching in the pocket. They couldn't give me a key fast enough. If I was unsure about committing before, I was committed now. And that's what I was beginning to understand. Loving Christ, living Christ, is not about showing up, although it helps. It's a good start. Giving your donation, then going home until the next week. No, what I realized now, after some 30 some odd years, as a congregationalist that's committed to Christ, it's a commitment to the church and it's a commitment to the community. You don't have to give all your assets to the church and have it dispensed as they see fit. But like 
likewise in the parable of the talents. Don't be this servant who is so fearful of the master that he buries the only talent given to him. But be like the brave servants that multiply their given talents and give to the master double what was given. Commitment is transformative. It brings out who you are and it makes you grow. I remember when we first moved to Marlboro, 12 years, 12, after 12 years in Middletown, Cindy sent me on another church recon mission. And I, we found, I found this lovely church in town and early on we became members. Now after 12 years of my previous congregational experience, I knew what was. So soon enough, I joined the trustees because that's my wheelhouse. I love, I love to work my hands, do things, fix things. And so as time went on, I started skipping the trust, monthly trustees meetings. Cindy would ask, don't you have a trustees meeting t tonight? And I'd say, yeah, but I don't feel like going. Well, a couple of more of these skips, and I soon got what I call a come to Jesus letter from my pastor. In the letter, he gently suggested, well, you know, maybe this time in your life, you're not prepared, or, you, or at this point, you're too busy to, to, uh, to be on a board. So I read that, and I, and I read between the lines. I had joined the board, but I wasn't committed. I wasn't even showing up. So I had my own epiphany. It was then I realized that commitment was much more than having a position. If I wanted to serve the church, if I wanted to serve the community, if I wanted to serve my Christ, I needed to commit. Then I found out I loved it. There was a satisfaction in my commitment. God gave me talents, and I became unafraid to use them. I returned back to him double, but what I got was tenfold in return. Thanks to Marcy and others, our stewardship is well on the way. And it's May 1st, by the way. It reminds me of when our last church in Marlboro, and during this, our stewardship drive there, the pastor would preach on giving. He would invariably note how many times money was mentioned in the Bible. It's 140, by the way. Indicating that it wasn't unusual to, to discuss monetary needs of the church. He would mention that money was key for the continuation of the church, and money is important to the church. But I argue commitment comes first. Commitment to Christ, commitment to your family, to your friends, your community, and your fellow men and women. Some give their treasure, some their talent, some both. But don't give to give and get out. Give because you want to give, because you're happy to give, because you know your community it is the only way that you can make a difference. So commit to serve and be joyful in it. Amen. When's our next, our next hymn?